We are following big breaking news this evening. Maine's Secretary of State, Sheena Bellows, has decided that former President Trump is ineligible to appear on that state's 2024 Republican primary ballot because he incited an insurrection at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th, almost three years ago. With her ruling, Maine has now become the second state to say that Trump is ineligible to appear on the 2024 Republican primary ballot. The Bellows decision comes a week after the Colorado Supreme Court issued a similar ruling. That ruling is now being appealed by both sides to the nation's highest court. The nine justices of the Supreme Court are being petitioned to settle the issue of whether Trump is barred from serving as president under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which bars any candidate from holding the office who engaged in insurrection. In her ruling tonight, Maine Secretary of State wrote, and I quote, I have little trouble concluding that the events of January 6, 2021, were an insurrection within the meaning of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. The record establishes that Mr. Trump, over the course of several months and culminating on January 6, 2021, used a false narrative of election fraud to inflame his supporters and direct them to the Capitol to prevent certification of the 2020 election and the peaceful transfer of power. Mr. Trump was aware of the likelihood for violence and at least initially supported its use, given he both encouraged it with, in, with incendiary rhetoric and took no timely action to stop it. The weight of the evidence makes clear that Mr. Trump was aware of the tinder laid by his multi-month effort to delegitimize a Democratic election and then chose to light a match. Bellows notes in the decision that she is aware it may be struck down by the Supreme Court. She also writes that she has paused the decision to strike Trump from the ballot pending a likely Trump appeal. Tonight, the Trump campaign is vowing to appeal in state court. It calls the decision, quote, atrocious, adding that it came from, quote, and I'm quoting, a virulent leftist and a hyper-partisan Biden-supporting Democrat who has decided to interfere in the presidential election on behalf of crooked Joe Biden. In her conclusion, the Maine Secretary of State writes, quote, I am mindful that no Secretary of State has ever deprived a presidential candidate of ballot access based on Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. I am also mindful, however, that no presidential candidate has ever before engaged in insurrection. The events of January 6th, she wrote, were unprecedented and tragic. They were an attack not only on the Capitol and government and officials, but also an attack on the rule of law. The evidence here demonstrates that they occurred at the behest of and with the knowledge and support of the outgoing president. The U.S. Constitution does not tolerate an assault on the foundations of our government. So we now have two states that have ruled that Trump did engage in insurrection and should not appear on their state's primary ballots. Those decisions will now clearly be appealed to, up to the U.S. Supreme Court, which will decide whether Trump is a legitimate candidate entitled to run for and hold the highest office in the land. The question is, how will the nation's highest court rule and when? Here with me now to discuss our former Deputy Assistant Attorney General Harry Lippman and Mark Joseph Stern, senior writer covering courts and the law for Slate Magazine. Thank you both very much for being here this evening. Mark, let me come to you. You, you first. Your reaction to the, the, the decision by the Maine Secretary of State. Uh, this is obviously a really big deal, and it feels like the dominoes are maybe beginning to fall. You know, when it was just Colorado that had gotten out in front, striking Trump from the ballot, it felt like maybe it was an outlier, an aberration. But now we have another state, Maine, that has undertaken a very serious review through the Secretary of State's office and reached the same conclusion. The legal analyses are beginning to all point in the same direction. The evidence that Trump incited an insurrection in the terms of the 14th Amendment, it's starting to pile up. And so I do wonder, if I were a Republican primary voter, might I think, you know, it, it's, it's Trump who I support, but it's time to start considering an alternative, because there's not even a 100 percent chance that this guy is constitutionally eligible to appear on the ballot in 2024. You know, uh, Harry, I read uh, lengthy excerpts from, um, from the, the Secretary of State's decision, but um, 
Maybe we should hear from um, Secretary Bellows herself. She was on MSNBC in the last hour. Listen. The record demonstrates that, in fact, the events of January 6, 2021, which were unprecedented and tragic, uh, were an insurrection uh, in the meaning of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. And finally, uh, in reviewing the facts presented, the evidence, uh, the law, the history, um, we determined uh, under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment that Mr. Trump engaged in insurrection and therefore was disqualified. And so, Harry, a main law requires her, Secretary of State Bellows, to make a decision before this goes to the courts. Two, two questions, and, and Mark alluded to this in, in his answer, but she had to do a review. This isn't just some decision that she came up on her own. Talk to us about how she came to this decision, and will this decision have any bearing on how the main courts consider this question? So on the second, yes, it will. I mean, they'll take it and, and review it with some deference. How did she come to it? Very similar to the Colorado Supreme Court. It's a methodical, uh, really well-reasoned opinion, pretty long, 34 pages. In particular, the piece of it, Jonathan, that analyzes whether he's an officer, which was the disputed issue between the Colorado trial court and Supreme Court. She has a much longer, sort of historically anchored analysis. I really think it's hard to quibble with what she's done under Maine law. On the other hand, this makes manifest what was sort of latent when, as Mark said, we had just Colorado, which is the U.S. Supreme Court is going to know that there's a, a real potential for a, a patchwork um, kind of pattern in the country where some, for different reasons, depending on state law, disqualify him, others don't. I think that's going to be anathema to them. And yet, it's a challenge because these are different state law kinds of rulings, and they can't just willy-nilly uh, slap them down unless they have one federal law uh, principle to do. And, for example, the, the um, possibility of saying he's not an officer, I think, got more remote today based on her pretty uh, well-reasoned analysis. Mm -hmm. and, 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 Mark, um, whether or not the Supreme Court has a 6-3 um, this conservative supermajority, the, the, the institution of the Supreme Court, just as an institution, doesn't like patchwork patterns, doesn't like to have different courts and different jurisdictions um, ruling in different ways. So is it inevitable that the Supreme Court will, will take this case? And, and how quickly do you think they will? I, I think the answer is yes, the Supreme Court will take up these cases, Colorado, Maine, perhaps more, and hopefully decide them very quickly because, of course, the primaries are right around the corner and it is now a contested question whether Trump is eligible to appear on the ballot. But I think that the Maine Secretary of State's decision tonight really creates a problem for the Supreme Court. You know, if this were just Colorado, the Supreme Court could have found some Colorado-specific reason to overturn the state Supreme Court, to say, well, Colorado law didn't provide sufficient due process to Donald Trump, that the Colorado Supreme Court didn't follow the state's election code correctly. Now we have a completely separate procedure, separate set of election laws, and Maine has reached the same conclusion. And so I do think this is going to force the court to consider going big, to consider issuing a big decision that, for instance, says Trump did not, by definition, engage in an insurrection. That would be a hugely controversial ruling, but I don't think the court can punt like it might have even just a day ago. It's going to have to get into the meat of these issues, and the country might not like its answers. Well, Harry, let's talk more about the, that Colorado ruling, because Colorado voters who won a victory at the Colorado State Supreme Court last week, uh, today, petitioned the Supreme Court to rule quickly. They asked for oral arguments on January 19th and a ruling by February 11th. Uh, 11th. <laughs> How likely is that schedule? Well, the schedule is not that unlikely. And by the way, I totally agree with Mark about the complicating factor here. They can't do a one-off opinion. This, that, that is, they are, they're a party. They intervene below. But the, the petition everyone's waiting for is Trump's. And that will come soon. Remember, the stay that Colorado Supreme Court gave expires on the 4th of January. And that request, uh, if he makes it for expedited treatment, or if Smith jumps in with that sort of request, that's when I think 
you'll see the court hopping to. I'm not certain whether this petition will trigger it, but it is a, a virtual certainty that A, they'll decide it, and B, they'll decide it quickly. Also, C, they wish they didn't have to, for the reasons <laughs> Mark just said. A, a polarized opinion would really look bad for the court, but they are stuck here. Uh, Mark, how likely is it that Justice Clarence Thomas recuses himself from any of these Trump-related cases, but especially um, the ballot access the cases? I would estimate that the odds are about 0%, Jonathan. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, Clarence Thomas <laughs> has, of course, participated in previous January 6th related cases, even though his wife, Ginny, was involved in trying to overturn the election and was actually at the ellipse on January 6th. I don't think this will be any different, even though the court has put forth what it calls a code of ethics. It is a non-binding and unenforceable code. There is no person or body that can require Clarence Thomas to recuse. The decision is still in his hands. And so even though under federal law he clearly should, I really don't think he will. Mm -hmm.